What I want to talk to you all about tonight, what I believe is at the heart of disruption, not just for those of us here in this room, but for mankind as a whole, is humanity 2.0. I want to talk about how we upgrade humanity. Now you'll see as we get into this topic that we're going to be asking a lot of questions, so I'd be a little remiss if I didn't allow you all to get a little bit of use out of your money and get to ask you a couple questions, get you involved. So let me begin by asking all of you here tonight, who here has children or plans to have children someday in the future? Go ahead, raise your hands. Come on, get your money's worth, let's see. Okay, now keep your hand raised if you want what's best for your child. Oh yeah, now the hands are up. Now, that's a pretty typical response, people like their kids. Now let me ask you this. Are you willing to use technology to ensure the best for your child? Okay, still a lot of hands up. Now here's the question for tonight. Are you willing to use any technology to ensure the very best for your child? How about implantable medical devices? How about robotics? How many hands stay raised when I say genetic engineering? Now, what we're trying to get at tonight is a question that science and society have struggled with for years. It's the question that just because we can doesn't mean we should. Are there things about humanity and human nature that should remain unchanged, pristine, or do we have an obligation to ensure what's best for our children and ourselves and embrace improvements and embrace upgrades? Now, I think it's important to point out that as humans, we're upgrading and developing things all the time. That's been true since the invention of the wheel, and it continues right now through our development of technology. I mean, look, we can send people in probes into outer space. We can construct mile-high buildings in Dubai. Or how about this one? Like, we've all been talking about cell phones tonight. With a device that fits in the palm of your hand, or now can be projected across the surface of your skin, you can access the internet, tweet your thoughts, upload live video. These devices will even help you find a hot date. Oh yeah. <laughs> Happiness is truly just a swipe away. <laughs> now, those who study technology often point to Moore's Law, and they use it to illustrate that Advances in technology often don't follow a nice linear rate, but often an exponential and explosive rate. And I'm here to tell you that as a result of that exponential growth in technology, that we are at a critical turning point in the history of mankind. That for the first time as a society and as the human race, we have technology, new science and technology will not simply improve our quality of life, but for the first time, we now have science and technology that can fundamentally enhance human life. I'm talking about technology that changes and upgrades our humanity. Let me begin by talking about something that I think a lot of us have some awareness of. Implantable medical devices. And by implantable medical devices, I'm talking about things like insulin pumps, cochlear implants, pacemakers, and much, much more. And now, all these devices were introduced out of a therapeutic need to address things like high blood sugar or to restore our hearing. In general, these devices restore our senses, improve our mobility. They give us back our functionality. But what I want to ask you to consider tonight is, what if we were able to take some of this technology beyond the realm of therapeutics? For example, let's look at some really interesting technology out there today called Protégé. Protégé is a very small, very small um, implantable medical device that was developed by St. Jude Medical and approved by the FDA just last year to address one of the largest therapeutic needs in this country, chronic pain, something more than one mil 100 million Americans know a, lot of lo know a lot about. 100 million. That's roughly one-third of our American population in pain, chronically. So you can see where the development of d technology like Protégé would be a pretty important money-making development, right? So many people having access to the chronic pain that they've always, you know, cared to manage. But what if we were to take a device like Protégé beyond the clinic and outside the hospital? What if we were to introduce it, say, 
to a boxing ring or out onto a battlefield. How would we feel if a boxer used implantable, like an implantable medical device to enhance their training? Would we consider it unfair or cheating? And if it did confer some advantage, wouldn't we want that benefit to be conferred to the soldiers defending our country? Now, what I want us all to consider is if, why, why would this matter? Is it because this idea differs from the norm? Or is it because feeling something like pain is something that is innately human? And it's something that makes the boxer real and normal. And if that is the criteria, then ask yourself, does augmenting the pain of non-athletes at least slightly change their humanity? It's exactly this type of issue that brings that question that I asked in the beginning. Just because we can, does it mean we should? It brings that question right into our faces. But implantable medical devices are just one piece of the puzzle I want to talk about tonight. Now, I want to talk about the potential for robotics and bionic technology to upgrade humanity. And I'm going to be talking about bionic prosthetics. Now, when I talk about bionic prosthetics, many of us are probably going to be thinking of Paralympians with these amazing mechanical attachments to their arms and legs. Or, come on, people, at the very least, we're thinking of Captain Hook. <laughs> but what I really mean is this. I mean articulate, sophisticated, dynamic, bioengineered bionic arms that achieve synergy with your body in that they actually respond to nerve impulses from your brain. As you can see, there's been some pretty big upgrades since the days of Captain Hook. And again, these bionic arms, very highly sophisticated, and you can actually program and customize them. And these bionic arms will respond to nerve signals running along your arms or your legs if it's a bionic arm or a bionic leg. And it's just incredible the advances we've seen in this technology. I mean, it's restoring functionality to people who have, an, uh, who have lost an arm like never before. But what I want us to consider tonight, again, is what if it was possible for a bionic arm not simply to replace a lost limb, but to actually upgrade it? What happens when a bionic arm becomes preferable to a biological arm? Or how about this? How about we go back to the boxer we talked about earlier? How about we give this boxer the bionic arm, not simply to feel less pain, but to quite literally crush the competition? How would you feel about such an upgrade? What, what would your reaction be to such augmentation to the human body? Should they even be allowed in the first place? Now, what I'm saying is bionic technology and bionic prosthetics, as well as implantable medical devices, offer therapeutic relief to many, many people, and they are great innovations in science and technology. But now I want to talk about a third area of science and ask you this question. What if instead of reacting to a problem in a retrospective way, in a reactionary way, what if you were able to correct or avoid the problem altogether? What would it take to make such a guarantee? Two words, genetic engineering. Never before have science and technology come together to produce a new area of knowledge that allows us to so profoundly alter our humanity and what it means to be human. I'm talking about the manipulation of DNA and genes. Just mentioning genetic engineering is enough to make some of you shift in your seats. Trust me, I can see it. Now. It's because for the first time in our humanity, in the history of mankind, we have the ability to look ourselves in the biological mirror and assess what we look like. And let me tell you, genes are the building blocks that make you, you. They dictate what you look like, they dictate your, dictate your eye color, your hair color, whether you're allergic to peanuts, or why you have a certain predisposition to certain types of cancer. Genetics even plays a role in deciding why certain people don't get hangovers. And in case you were curious, we call those people in science the official term, jerks. So, <laughs> but genetic engineering is changing our ability to 
fight and treat disease. And what we're seeing is an explosive growth in technology and genetic engineering, primarily using a technique called in vitro fertilization, which some of you may know, in vitro fertilization involves the creation of embryos outside of the womb in a laboratory setting. And what makes in vitro fertilization such an alluring tool to genetic engineering is that it allows scientists the opportunity to assess the genetic fitness and the genetic makeup of embryos before they're implanted. Now, to help you kind of understand what that the ramifications for something like that might be, let's think about newborn screening. Today, when infants are born here in the United States in a hospital, they will undergo rapid genetic screening for severe diseases such as Tay-Sachs, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, and an increasing list of metabolic disorders. And now, through genetic engineering, scientists are able to apply similar genetic screening techniques using a process called pre-implantation genetic diagnostic testing. Scientists are able to test the genetic fitness of embryos prior to, to implantation. So rather than waiting till infancy, scientists are able to do it one step sooner. And now parents have a completely new world of choices when it comes to deciding what's best for their child. They can get their embryos, the embryos that they create, to, they can have them sequenced and screened for severe genetic diseases. And I think to really appreciate the gravity of that, consider you are a parent in this situation. Say that your family has a severe disease. Let's pick Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a very devastating disease. And what if you wanted to avoid at all costs passing that on to your child? So you elected to go through in vitro fertilization and use pre-implantation genetic diagnostic testing to help avoid passing that on to your child. So then, let's add this. What if you weren't simply able to screen between the good embryos that didn't have the disease and the bad embryos that did? What if you were able to actually correct that problem? What if you were able to actually correct the genetic code in your child's embryo or in your embryo? Sound a little like science fiction? A little too good to be true? Introducing the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system. By studying the ways in which bacteria are able to naturally remove DNA or unwanted genes from their genome, scientists have discovered the word processor of genomics. What I mean by that is, scientists can now add, copy, paste, delete, and rewrite entire sections of genes and genomes at specific locations, both quickly and accurately. Now you can imagine that the advent of such technology is leading to a revolution in the world of genetic engineering in that now scientists around the world are able to use gene editing technology to study severe human diseases such as HIV and cancer using animal models though. And that's the crucial key, animal models for human diseases. So the question is, when will we begin as our understanding of this technology and how it can be applied in animals, when will we make that transition to humans? Already there are proposals out there for the use of gene editing technology in human trials with patients for advanced disease. And right now, I think it's important just to not only look at this gene editing technology, but to have a better understanding of what our potential in genetic engineering is. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask you a couple quick true or false questions. The first true or false question I'd like to ask, true or false, is it possible to take a gene from one species and implant it into an organism, a completely separate organism, okay? The answer is true. I want you guys all to meet Andy. Andy is the first genetically modified rhesus monkey. By inserting a gene a green fluorescent protein gene from jellyfish, researchers at Oregon Health Sciences University, yes, just right up the road, success, successfully created the world's first transgenic glow-in-the-dark monkey. And now, although the application for glow-in-the-dark animals may be limited, what's important to realize here is that not only is this level of 
technology and science available and possible, it's being done. Okay, let me ask another question. So now that we know that jellyfish and monkeys can share genes, is it possible to incorporate animal DNA into the human genome? Interesting. Not only is it possible to mix animal DNA with human DNA, but there are labs around the world in the United Kingdom and in Japan that are currently researching with human-animal hybrid embryos in order to advance our knowledge of human disease. Again, this isn't an example of, oh yeah, maybe someday we'll have this technology. No, right now it's here, right here. Okay, let me ask one more question. <laughs> Can a child have more than two biological parents? Okay, sounds, I hear some yeses. Apparently people were reading the news last week. Last week, this article was published in the United Kingdom. And I think it shows that how far we've come with genetic engineering and science in general. Our understanding of genetics and cellular biology has advanced to the point where we are now capable of producing or creating children with three biological parents. I'm talking about two mothers and one father. Wow, sure not like the good old days, right? <laughs> and if you have some goosebumps at this point, I just want you to know that you're not alone. This is disruption. This is our world. We are experiencing change because the technology to change humanity is here and it is being developed daily. Now this disruption will call for the creation of new paradigms, social paradigms. We'll, look, we'll call for the creation of new ethics and legal framework. It will change the way we look at humanity forever. We, as a society, are witnessing the advent of new technology that will transform our world and therefore transform all of our lives. We, this is our time. We are the generation that must guide humanity into this new future. We must decide what's best for our children and we must decide how best to preserve and help stave off the suffering of those enduring severe genetic disease while simultaneously remaining cognizant to where we are headed as a species. This responsibility has never been placed on the shoulders of mankind because we are not just on the edge of change, we are in the midst of change. And starting now, the time to make the right decisions about the future of humanity only become shorter and shorter. We cannot delay. No longer can we abstain from conversations about our future because inaction can be just as dangerous as action. The question is before you. Is humanity ready for an upgrade? What's your answer? Thank you. <laughs>